Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hi, everybody. Ruben Bressler. What's going on? How's it going? Uh, quite the pre-show. Just want y'all to know that the end of that pre-show <laughs> started out innocently enough. Started enough. out one thing. Ended we up. got into an interesting discourse on a side dish. On a side dish. <laughs> um, <laughs> just letting you know, there's uh, it's, uh, some interesting content. It's a hot dish. If it's you, a hot if dish. You think about it. All right. Well, we also began with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call honorable mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most eloquent and let us know what card we did not choose as one of our top ten four CMC cards. Ruben? There were so many cards really that could have made ones. our top 10 lists and so many great comments yeah. about cards that could have made our top 10 lists, but I elected to go with the majority mm-hmm. and we had the most comments about Siege Rhino mm-hmm. overall, and Ian Edney's comment I thought was very good, which was, when thinking of the best four drops of all time, I'm surprised that no one had the incredibly pushed Rhino some may say, pushed a bit too much. That is Siege Rhino. The absolute powerhouse of a creature went under many people's radar during spoiler season. However, during the time it was legal in standard, it showed up in every top eight of every Pro Tour and World Cup, except for Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch, and solidified itself as an all-star player in modern and standard alike. It's hard to get more raw power than Siege Rhino, but when one Rhino isn't enough... The second rhino will always get the job done. They always come in yeah. pairs. Yeah. We also contemplated uh, because we had so many siege rhino comments. We talked about you know yeah they come in pairs. We were like maybe we should pick two people and then split the gift certificate in half. We thought people wouldn't like that, but we did right. consider it. We do think yeah. of cute ideas. We just don't necessarily execute right. them. For those who don't know, siege rhino originally showed up in Cons of Tarkir. It's a black, green, white, and generic mana. So it is a. Uh, Obzon card, or Abzan, depending on how you say it. So 4-5 with Trample. It's a rare Rhino. And whenever it enters the battlefield, each opponent loses 3 life and you gain 3 life. I distinctly remember Patrick Chapman going like, Lit people, this card is insane. Yeah. This card yep. is going to be the yeah. thing you do for years. And it was the thing we did for years. This card was yep. amazing. I vaguely remember that you were not hot on this card, Evan. Probably when not. When it first came out. I kept this getting was burned. Not, it wasn't quite like a Goblin Instigator Spectral Procession, but this one could have been on that, that list. Um, but, of course, everyone came around on it very quickly. Yes. Uh, and, yeah, there was a period of time where it was pretty good in modern. There was a Abzan mid-range deck. Yeah, I mean, you put a Lightning Helix of the Face on a 4-5 Trampler for 4 mana. Yeah. Like, exactly. That, that's a hell What's of a What's the worst card. that could be? Yeah. And I certainly agree to be one of the top 10 four CMC cards of all time. So thanks, Ian, for being a part of the show. Please contact Aaron on social media before she blocks you on all of them. 32,000 plus. <laughs> and, and growing. Counting. And counting. It's that's probably right. increased since then. It yeah. has, yeah. So before you're part of the 33,000... Thanks again to CoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring this giveaway. And stay tuned for our top 10 list this week. And maybe you can win one of next week's free gift certificates. So we are talking about Zendikar Rising. A new set is upon us. I am ready for it. It also pushes out Ravnica and friends into the world of yep. Pioneer and Historic and just mm. go that way. It's fine. It's not you, it's Get me. Those planeswalkers out of here. I mean, yeah. I, I love Ravnica. I love the Shocklands, you know, then the yeah. guilds and stuff. And I, I appreciate it, but we are, we have time to move on. It's just, yeah. It's good. Well, uh, fish and guests should only stay for three days. Otherwise, they start to smell. And. <laughs> You know, what? we've had we've had War of the Spark and Ravnica sets around for long enough, and you didn't like my Benjamin Franklin quote? Fine. Speaking um, of fish, uh, modern Simic Merfolk top eighted the modern <laughs> challenge this past wow. weekend. Dope. Amazing, yeah, right. I mean, you know, but you know, War of the Spark just being one of the most powerful, impactful sure. sets. Uh, Planeswalker, and we've every had it for a year and a half. Right. Like we're good. We've but played you have to it. Consider that at least two it. cards were banned in vintage, like. With restricted in vintage, restricted within relatively vintage. short order, like just just rose all the way to the top and caused chaos. That's saying something about the yeah. the power level of this set. And the power level certainly, as of right now, doesn't appear to be going in the down direction. Uh, Zendikar yeah. Rising has lots of. I wouldn't say stuff. it's going. I would say it's maintaining its yeah. course. Yes. Nothing about um, this set seems terribly busted. Right. right. It seems very powerful, but in in much the same way that uh, when you're when you're doing stage fighting, you're supposed to hit hard. 
but in safe places. Mm -hmm. This looks like the set that hits hard, but in safe places. Yeah, Yeah, that's a good way way to put it. it. Right, and I mean, I think you know we got other analogies of like you know maybe they kind of went little little pedal to the metal when it hit Throne of Eldraine, and we have Once Upon a Time and Friends, yeah, and then we kind of back up a little bit. So now we're going faster on the highway than we were previously, right? You know, but not insanely fast where something crashes and we die. Right? Yeah, exactly. So that means we get to talk about Zendikar Rising, our top ten cards. Aaron, kick us off with your number ten. So I have to admit, when I first saw my number 10, I wasn't really a big fan. It was obviously a callback to an older card, and it didn't do what I what I wanted it to do. But then I realized that I was just being shellfish, and it's an awesome <laughs> card, and my number 10's Ruin Crab. I love it. <laughs> I have to give my, my boyfriend credit for that one. So Ruin Crab is one blue. It's a creature crab, zero power, three toughness. With landfall, it says whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent mills three cards. This is obviously a playoff of Hedron Crab. Um, and I was hoping that with Hedron Crab, you can actually mill yourself. And so um, you can play this in like a Vengevine strategy or in like a Muldrotha commander deck. And so you can't target yourself with Ruin Crab. However, Ruin Crab does let you hit each opponent. So in a commander game, this is actually more, could be seen as more valuable than Hedron Crab because you have to actually target one person with that. And so um, definitely some pros and cons. It has one more toughness. It's each opponent. Um, but, you know, there are those those mill folks out there who just, you know, are determined to win a game that way. And there are actually a lot of really neat toys for mill players in this set. Yes. Yeah. This is and there's one... a lot of good toys for mill players still in standard. Yeah. Um, to play alongside of this as well. I lost to that mono blue deck before. Sure. <laughs> I mean, you get an extra point of toughness. Every opponent now mills, which is great. You know, this is one that has one of those showcase frame versions. The showcase frame foil is 10 bucks plus. Mm-hmm. Like, wow. yeah, people love their crabs. Their little milling crabs. They love milling <laughs> decks. Mm-hmm. Like, I was uh, just looking at, you know, some content earlier today, and there's a mill deck that Jim Davis did in August, and it is the yeah. highest viewed video over the past year. And it's only people been out for like four mill. weeks. People love mill. Yeah. People love, love that stuff. Look, they do. I've had crabs before, and I'll have them again. <laughs> wow. Um, because I am a big fan. Quote oh, Ruben Bressler twice. Life, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's fine. You, know, you gotta do what you gotta do, buddy. Stay safe. Look, they pinch. That's all. That's all I care about. Is do they pinch? They pinch. Put them in my deck. They pinch. Yeah. I pinch. I pinch. <laughs> Ruben, I don't have a number ten because it's higher on someone's list. Ruben, what's your number ten? My number ten is a card that features an ability that Aaron doesn't like. Now, Aaron is very stupid. However, um, I think I think that if if you give party a chance you will come to enjoy it and if there's one card that i think that uh can break through it's archpriest of iona yeah Mm. great one i think archpriest of iona is amazing Mm -hmm. one white mana that's it for a human cleric it's a star two where archpriest of iona's power is equal to the number of creatures in your party and your party consists of up to one each of cleric rogue warrior and wizard at the beginning of combat on your turn if you have a full party target creature gets plus one plus one and gains flying until end of turn so you look at what's possible to put together it's i mean the party decks are going to be very strange looking you're going to have stuff like wildwood tracker and thieves guild enforcer but you know it's possible to build these decks um i foresee for example uh cheville bane of monsters which is a one three with death touch for a black and a green that's a Uh human rogue Mm -hmm. that's a mythic from uh ikoria starting to pick up more play now that uh party is a thing um and if you have a full party boy howdy this is a ton of value on just a one drop like this feels like the default one drop. If there is going to be a constructed party deck, this is the thing you want on. It's got a lot of really cool abilities. It's good early. It's good late. Like once it is late and you have your full party, it gives you enough of a bonus to go up and over whatever they're trying to do. So it gives evasion, which is fantastic. It's also the only arch priest in all of magic, which I thought was wow. interesting. There are no other yeah. arch priests. I mean, I foresee playing this and then seasoned hollow blade attack for two, three drop attack for six. Like it's going to be gross. Exactly. And I want to definitely play some party decks in the preview stream. I'm excited about that. Uh, All right. So like I said, my number 10 was higher on someone else's list. Let's go here to number nine. Aaron, what's number nine? 
My number nine is another card that I'm excited about for Commander. Um, you know, it's always nice to see, you know, power creep in action, particularly when it gets to replace, you know, staples or right? iconic cards from a format or cards that we've been using for a long time. And if it's good enough to replace them, that that's a really, really cool feeling. Uh, my number nine is Skyclave Relic. Mm-hmm. Um, so Skyclave Relic is three colorless. It's an artifact with kicker, three colorless, and it's indestructible. Uh, when Skyclave Relic enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, create two tapped tokens that are copies of Skyclave Relic, and you can tap it to add one mana of any color. So you could argue that this is a replacement of Darksteel Ingot, which, you know, does, you know, three colorless, indestructible, one mana of any color. Um, this even could compete with uh, Everflowing Chalice, which is another kind of kicker, you know, mana rock that gets better the more mana you have. But um, I think there's some really neat things you can do with this card, you know, the ability to make more mana rocks. These are now more artifacts. If you're doing anything um, right. that involves a certain number of artifacts, you know, this certainly will help you with that. Um, you know, these are permanents. These are things you can tap. These are, um, you know, things like that. And so I, I think there's just something here um, and um, it doesn't seem like it's very expensive right now but i'm anxious to see if it takes off or if people do anything with it right i mean the well the extended art is about six bucks the extended art foil almost up to 16 already so uh yeah that's not a card that's gonna be cheap because it goes into so many decks easily it's just a really cool mana rock period which is yeah, awesome. Darksteel Ingot had sort of fallen out of favor. There had been so many new mana rocks that had been printed, the new talismans, mm-hmm. reprints of various two-mana artifacts, but this is certainly the kind of artifact where you go, well, it's actually a split card, right? Mm-hmm. And having Indestructible is no joke. You can certainly play this in those Obliterate decks, um, any of those sort of uh, uh, strategies as well. You know, I feel like as Wizards continues to make more and more cards that copy permanence, that maybe we will get to a point where they will give us token copies of permanence. Like, wouldn't it be cool to have the official copy token of Skyclave Relic so you wouldn't have to go buy extra copies or whatever? You wouldn't have to use slips of paper or whatever you're doing. Right. Like, you could actually have the copy version of it. You could have the clone version of Jace. Wouldn't that be super cool? Right. Um, That's another thing they could put... I've certainly certainly controlled more pack rat tokens than I have pack rats. I'm not (laughs) sure that's going to be the case for Skyclave Relic, uh, but, you know, it could be. Nevertheless. Ruben, what's your number nine? My number nine is a card that has an effect that whenever it's on a card, it is always good. Every single time this effect is on a card, it sees play. Whether it's the best deck in the format, not always. Whether it's good, it's you almost always good. I've very rarely seen the sentence, whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life, go on a card... And it's not at least playable in some format or in some way. And so I think Relic Vile deserves a brief mention. Relic Vile is a three colorless mana artifact. It is an uncommon. And it has pay two colorless and tap and sacrifice a creature. Draw a card. Mm. And it also has as long as you control a cleric. Relic Vile has, uh, quote, whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So you get both the effect of a Bastion of Remembrance or a Blood Artist, as well as the effect of a Carnage Altar. Well, yep. once a turn at least. And that is an incredibly pot- potent combo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting card because it, it doesn't necessarily do anything eh, quite on its own. You know, I would be concerned about my clerics being killed while this is on the stack, for example. Sure. Um, but, you know, late game, right? You're looking for some reach, looking for something to do with token creatures, for example. This is a good thing to just toss them in there. And again, as long as you have a cleric, you're getting even more benefit off that. Drawing cards and draining life. That seems sweet. There. Yeah, and it's also not a creature, so it doesn't get swept up in the wraths, mm. which is a huge deal. Um, yeah. So, you, so if you play this as you go one drop, two drop... So you go one drop Archpriest, for example, two drop another creature, three drop this, and then they Wrath. They're only getting two of your creatures, and you're still doming them uh, with your with your uh, with your relic. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why Bastion of Remembrance has bumped um, out cards like Falcon Wrath Noble in Commander because you can't kill it, and so you know it's cheaper, it's more difficult to remove, it comes with something additional tacked onto it. You know, if you are looking to build a dedicated cleric stack, you know this this seems like it's worth it's worth running. Absolutely. So um, my number nine here, now that I have an option, is a land, which is great from the land set. 
which is fantastic. This one is not getting as much kind of press or buzz or hype or whatever, when I secretly think it's one of the best damn lands they've made in years and years. This thing looks to be unbelievably playable in almost any control deck. I would not be surprised to see this reaching into older formats. I love, love Crawling Barons. Crawling Barons is a rare land that taps for a colorless mana, a wingding. For four generic mana colon, you put two plus one plus one counters on it. Then you may, that's a may, have it become a zero zero elemental creature until end of turn. It's still a land. And that Why may to me is the key. Why because you then though? you don't open it up to removal. Exactly. You say you're in a control turn, mirror. Just add that counters. Yeah. And you're in a control okay. mirror. I'm in a blue. I'm a blue white deck with 15 lands in play. You're a blue black deck with 15 lands in play. I play this. Go. And you're like, oh, draw my eighth card. I now have a handful of doom blades and counter spells. Go. And you're like, all right, pump four mana into this. Don't open it up to doom blade. Pump four more mana into this. Don't open it up for doom blade. Untap. Okay, that's fair. So, and then you untap, and then you can play it at cast or activate it on your turn, turn it into a creature, then you have the shields up, you can control it and, and keep it alive, and it can be huge at that point, because, again, right. all game, you can just sit there and just pump counters in this thing. That may is so unbelievably important. Had it not been there, I'd have been like, this is fine, you're probably going to get caught with, you know, whatever, but no, no, the magic is the may in that. Uh, so I think that card's great. Let's move on here to number eight. This is my last hire, but it's a really sweet card, so I'm excited about it. Ruben, what's your number eight? My number eight is, uh, I mean, it has landfall, and it's an aggressive landfall creature. Now, there's a bunch of great new aggressive landfall creatures in the set, and I think that we'll probably talk about at least a couple of them. Mm -hmm. But for my money, this is the most frightening of them, because we've never seen anything quite like Brushfire Elemental. Mm -hmm. Brushfire Elemental is a red and a green mana for a 1-1 elemental creature with haste, and Brushfire Elemental can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. And it has landfall. Whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, it gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. So, a number of things here. Play to Geopede was a card that saw tons of play in standard. That was a two mana one one that when you play the land, it got plus two, plus two until end of turn. Right. This is the same, except it has haste. And it can't be blocked very easily. It can't even be blocked by itself, which I think is huge, especially for, for mirror matches. Right. So I think that we're going to see a lot of Brushfire Elementals. For example, you know, turn two, play Brushfire Elemental. Turn three, play another one. Fabled Passage, get a tapped land. You're still attacking for 10. Well, I was going to say, hold on. We could also just, you know, turn two or turn three, rather, Lotus Cobra, play any sort of fetch land evolving wild sure. forever. Play the second Whatever. brush for elemental. Fine. Yeah, just... Look, go to town. All the things are go. great. Go. This card, this card isn't even that mat. Like the floor for this card is so high yeah. that it doesn't matter what the ceiling is. Mm -hmm. The worst that this is ever going to be is a 1-1 one -one that's tough to block the turn you draw it. Which is, be you know, still good after a Wrath. Mm -hmm. It's still tough to deal with for the control decks. It's still getting value even if you get one for one with removal. And it only costs two mana. Card's dope. Seems like there's a red-green landfall aggro thing. It's certainly going to be a four of in there. All right. Aaron, what's your number eight? Well, if you're looking for a place to put that Relic Vial, um, then I have just the deck for you. This is not the um, pre-show, Aaron. Had... We have talked about this. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> um, it, you know, I've been meaning to build an Orzhov commander deck for a while, and this is exactly where I want to be. It's only going for around 50 cents right now, which is just my speed. I uh, can't wait to build with this card. Uh, my number eight is Aura Skyclave Hierophant. There is some aura in this house. Oh my god. I had to, I'm sorry. Um, so Aura Skyclave Hierophant is two colorless, a white and a black. He's a legendary creature, Core Cleric, uh, with three power, three toughness, and lifelink. Uh, whenever Aura or another cleric you control dies, return target cleric card with lesser converted mana cost from your graveyard to the battlefield. So um, Shadowborn Apostle, those are clerics. Um, there's over 300 clerics. The last time I looked at Sky Scryfall, and so, um, you know, there are a lot of white black ones. Um, there's the... Um, uh, Scion of Darkness, I think it is, where you sacrifice yep. a bunch of clerics and then you get a demon. And so, yep, yep, yep. Um, you know, there's all sorts of really dumb things you can do with this card. And you can even just play fair magic. You know, you don't necessarily, you know, need to be doing anything combo horrific. You can just slam like a rot lung reanimator or what have you and then just play magic. And then if your clerics die, you know, you get a zombie and, you know, something's going to come back. And so I'm really, really excited to see what I can do with this card. Yeah, this, this is sweet. This is scrap trawler for clerics. Yep. So like you can chain them like you you so a four drop dies, you get a three, a three drop dies, you get a two. 
it's so much value. Mm-hmm. It's and it's insane. Then you have your changelings and friends, so you can start to do fun stuff with that, which is nice. Yep. Uh, and it's kind of sweet. You have your aristocrat effect in the vial. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, you have the uh, ability to get this as an extended art, uh, non extended art foil, I believe it is for the box topper version, or if they're the the buy box version. Yeah, um, which has really cool art by uh, Anna Stom- Steinbauer, which is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this card is spectacularly good. I really yeah. like this card a lot. It was made to be a cool commander, is the way i see it and it looks to be a really well yeah the stats that are on it signify that you know it's it's a probably not going it depends on what the removal looks like after standard i'm planning on playing a cleric deck on wednesday so we'll see we'll see hey all right so let's move on here to number seven uh, this is the part where Aaron goes and takes a small nap. Uh, we see we talk to her later about <laughs> my stuff. seven, my six, and my five are all higher. I don't normally have streaks like this, um, yeah. but when I do, I go all in. So, hey, oh, well, I've had that. I'll just myself. like I'll just like kind of smile at the camera. Just we can still talk yeah. about the cards that we talk about, which is yeah, great. Of course. Uh, but that means Ruben, what's your number seven? My number seven is a card that feels to me like it is a shoe in. For being a automatic include for blue sideboards in many, many, many formats. Okay. Maybe not going all the way back to vintage, but maybe because this would have a positive effect against fetch lands. Okay. Um, this would, or well, positive for you, but your opponents not so much. Um, but certainly in a set with landfall where people are trying to ramp and put multiple lands into play, and certainly in a format like modern where there are lots of decks that are trying to cheat lands into play, I can see confounding conundrum being yeah. a heck of a card for any metagame. Confounding conundrum is a colorless and a blue for an enchantment. It is a rare from Zendikar Rising. Mm. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So it ought, the worst to worst, it's just cycles, right? It just puts another card into play for your city's blessing, and it replaces itself. Yep. But that's not all. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, if that player had another land enter the battlefield under their control this turn, they return a land they control to its owner's hand. So your opponent goes, Fabled Passage, Search for a Basic... It goes back to their hand. They can mm-hmm. tap it, but it goes back to their hand. Your opponent plays a primeval titan. Oh, well, those lands, well, some of them were going to go back to their hands anyway because they search for a simic growth chamber, but they all go back. Yeah. They're all going back. And primeval titan decks have been making a comeback in modern the last couple of weeks, particularly around Uro and Field of the Dead. And so they're looking to, you know, escape shift is, is, is back as well, thanks to Renin Six. And so, you know, if not in standard, you know, at least in modern, you know, this card could see play. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, I think there's still a snow deck in Legacy as well. Mm-hmm. I don't know how viable it is, but um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely potential with this card. This has to be the ultimate punchline to a escape shift deck. And you're like, yeah. Turn to play this, draw a card, watch you shrivel up and die in front of me. Like, mm-hmm. it has to be yeah. amazing. Uh, this card is just weird. This is one of those, like, it's very strange, weird magic cards. It's something really weird and narrow. Like, we're not going to see anything like this in the future. Uh, this is one of those cards that's also tough to reprint because it's so weird. It's not going to just fit into any random set, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and it's kind of I mean, hate, it is but not it, kind of hate-ish. It is, I mean, it's hate. It's, it's hate, definitely hate. It's weird, weird hate. And it's, and it's not... Um, it's not a mirror. You can still play extra lands. It's right. only opponents. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Wizards has many cycles in the set, as they do with all the sets. But, you know, the, the cycles that are most exciting to me, the, the idea that you could just have two-sided cards, like just straight up, they're two completely separate magic cards, whatever you want them to be. The fact that I got to debut that in Zendikar, which was amazing, so they could put these awesome spells on the backs of lands Mm -hmm. which means like your lands are not only your threats they're also your answers they're also your tricks like there's so much that they're doing with this set it's fantastic and the card that sort of epitomizes that of like how cool is it when you have lands on one side and spells on the other well the front side of this is called undo inversion undo Um. inversion is very expensive for what it does it's two white and six generic mana so eight mana for a rare sorcery that destroys all non land permanents. We've had this in Planar Cleansing for three white yep. and three generic. So for six mana we got it now. It's eight. Or the Hour of Devastation I think. Yep. The yeah. Hour of Revelation. 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 Thank yeah. you. But 
on the back side, it's also a rare land that enters the battlefield tap that taps for a white mana. This is one of the most perfect control cards I've ever seen in my life. This mm -hmm. is the four of in every control deck you're going to play for a very long time, at least in standard, because my God, what the other side clears everything. Who doesn't want right. a sweet board wipe that on turn two, you just play tap and say, go like, that's fantastic. I can't get over how cool these cards are. It's just fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, that's this, this card is going to be, uh, this is, I mean, some of the, it is very expensive. Eight mana is a, a lot. lot of mana. It is. Um, but if you play four of them, the first three are going to be lands. And then the fourth one is going to clear out your opponent's non-land permanents, which, oh, by the way, also clears out their planeswalkers that you have been having trouble uh, trying to clear out of the way as well. So this is a, a very potent card. I'm very excited. Yeah, this card is absolutely sweet. So, you know, being able to get rid of Ugin, you know, while also being part of your mana base is just, mm -hmm. and I've started to see these weird lists and it's like they're running 14 lands because the other 10 are yep. also spells, which is yep. just incredible. Um, really weird, but cool. All right. Let's move on here to number six. Uh, Aaron still in Napville. All right, cool, cool. <laughs> Ruben, what is number six? Speaking of spe spells on one side, lands on another. Oh. Um, I mean, I'm in love with all of these cards. Yeah, I'm not surprised so. to see lists that have, I, I mean, we might see lists that have single digit lands in them because yeah. the whole rest of the deck is going to be split cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is no different. This one's very exciting for me because it can operate as both parts of what you want as a ramp deck. It can either be a ramp piece or it can be a land drop. Mm. And that's very important. In addition to that, the most important thing about this card is that it's adorable. It is very cute. Um, the set of Zendikar Rising, in fact, has a ton of very cute cards. I'm a little upset that I wasn't able to put Canyon Jerboa on my list because that <laughs> thing is adorable. Oh I love it, it, it so it much. It's real. Yeah, it's got to be yeah. fake. But uh, Tangled Florahedron, mm. I think, oh, takes the cake God. for uh, so what good. I want a plushie of or like a, like a Funko Pop. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I had my druthers, uh, Randy Vargas just absolutely killed it with Tangled Florahedron. Uh, the front side, of course, is Tangled Florahedron. It's a colorless and a green for a 1-1 elemental that taps to add a green mana. Then the back is Tangled Veil, which is just some, some Florahedron's napping, and it enters the battlefield tapped and adds a green mana. So if your entire deck is nothing but forests and tangled Florahedrons, that's like kind of fine, yeah. right? Like you go turn one, tangled veil, turn two, forest Florahedron, turn three, Florahedron, Florahedron, and you go to town. <laughs> Like, this card's insane. I would play 12 of these in a draft deck. I shout out to Adam Bernello, a cosplayer in the Magic community, who threw together a very good cosplay of this in a very small amount of time. Nice. Um, I believe he is, oh God, what is his Twitter handle? He is Adam, Adam Bernello. Well, <laughs> A-D-A-M-B-A-R-N-E-L-L-O. -L -L uh, really, really great pictures of this and just a gorgeous, gorgeous shot. This is just one of those cards where like, I mean, you're I, as an old school player, right? Somebody I've been around the game since 1996 i'm like damn this card is so efficient and yeah. good and what you want it it's to be it's just a good role player yeah and it's mm -hmm. not like super punishing they could have made this cost three mana right and you just still played it but you wouldn't like it two mana is mm -hmm. still in the realm of that's reasonable like it's no paradise druid but it's not so paradise druid doesn't have a land stapled on the back of her right like, it's incredible exactly. so yeah these cards are fantastic so Let's talk about my number six. Uh, my number six is uh, is a card that I was not expecting them to create. I was certainly not expecting them to use a mechanic on this type of card because we all love Zendikar. Zendikar is cool. Zendikar has kicker. Lots of sets have had kicker. Arguably, a ton of mechanics are just reversions of kicker, but they just call it something else or whatever. But, you know, once you start kicking a Planeswalker, things get a little crazy. It's true. From Jace Mirror Mage. I love this card. Two blue, one generic mana. For a four loyalty mythic legendary planeswalker Jace that has kicker of two generic mana. So you can pay three or five if it, if it enters the battlefield. If it was kicked, you create a token copy of Jace Mirror Mage, except it's not legendary, and its starting loyalty is one. Plus one, scry two, zero colon, draw a card and reveal it. Remove a number of loyalty counters equal to that card's converted mana cost from Jace Mirror Mage. So we go from Sarkin the Mad's ability, which is what that zero is, from red-black all the way over into blue because blue gets everything. 
<laughs> also at five mana, this is amazing because of course you can set up your draw with the copy and then use the real one to zero colon and to put it into your hand, which is yeah. fantastic. So this card seems yeah. pushed and fan fantastic up up one side down the other. There are yeah. such really cool play lines with this card. I mean, obviously it's a three mana planeswalker, which is great, and it starts at four loyalty, which is above rate for a True. three mana planeswalker. Mm-hmm. At five, they combo with each other. They play off of each other. And yeah. so you can use the one that has one to scry, and then you can draw the card and keep the other Jace around. Yeah, I like this because it still feels kind of narrow. Like, like, And, and you know, I, I'm not the best at evaluating cards. We know this. But, you know, when I look at this card, I don't see this as something you jam. You know, like when you looked at when there was mono red, when there was the red Chandra, when there was a Torch of Defiance, or there right. was, you know, Teferi, you were playing that. Like, if you were in those colors, that's what you were doing. And, you know, this is certainly powerful. Powerful, but I look at this more like that new Kaya, where it was like, you know, you didn't want to put her in every Orzov deck, but the ones that had Orzov colors and, and fit with this, she was really quite good. And I think this is the same. This is how I look at this Jace of not every deck's going to want him, but the right deck, he's he's going to shine. Right. And remember, you know, 30 plus percent of the time, that zero colon is just going to get you a land. It's not going to do anything to their loyalty. So you can kick it and then zero and then zero and just, you know, run the percentages and hope that the copy token doesn't die. Also, there were so many jokes about wanting to kick Jace. (laughs) Who does not want to kick Jace? Jace has waxed and waned as being a likable character. And there were a lot of tweets after this that were like, I would love to kick Jace. (laughs) We need to kick him. We need to kick him now. Yes, we do. Let's move on here to number five, the last of the hires for Aaron. Ruben, what's number five? All I want, all I want is to play, is for Death Bellow Warcry to be playable. Okay. That's all I want all in my I life. Want. All I want to do is search my library for four Minotaur cards <laughs> and put them into play. Oh, no. And I think we have the Minotaur to do it now? Maybe? Question mark? Mm-hmm. I mean, if we mm-hmm. can't, with Morog Fury of Akum, I'm not sure it's possible. Because this card... Whew, oh. Morog, Fury of Akum, is four colorless red red for a legendary creature Minotaur Warrior that is a 6-6... Six, six, for six, each creature you control gets plus one plus oh for each time it attacked this turn. Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, if it's your main phase, there's an additional combat phase after this phase. At the beginning of that combat, untap all creatures you control. Goodness. Ooh, ooh. So, six, six for six. All right, fine. But we're playing this on turn seven with a Fabled Passage and attacking three times is what we're doing. Wait, wait, um, wait three? Wait, yeah, so, we have so... our normal. we have our normal attack phase. All right, get that one. We have an extra attack phase for the Fabled Passage, and then we have an extra oh, attack phase for that other land. Geez. That's right. This card is insane. <laughs> this card's bananas. And also, we can use that Fabled Passage to go get a mountain and cast something like Samet's Sprint or Cartouche of Zeal or something on our Morog to actually get to attack with it this turn. Mm. Yeah, this card was my number eight. Uh, Morog is just unbelievable. Like, this is one of those cards where you're like, wait, 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 wait. You don't get, like, them in a row, right? You only get the one extra, right? They worded it so you only get one extra. No, no, you get all of them. You get however many landfall triggers, is however many combat steps you can get. The only drawback is I have to trigger all of them during my main phase. Oh, snap. Like, you got me, Magic. You did it this time. <laughs> right. We're never going to be able to figure out a way to do that. This card is insane. It's super duper expensive. The foils are starting to jack up to 80 bucks for the extended art Jeepers. showcase ones. For the, yeah, wow. for the extended art, you know, fancy ones are super nice. This card is already $13, $14 just for a non-foil regular copy. Uh, like, players all over love this thing. Not just the spikes yeah. of the world, of course, but the commander players are just right. Because Minotaur's been one of those tribes that's always been, like, on the fringe, where it's like, you know, we get this trickle of Minotaurs. You get, like, one or two here and there, but you're not quite, you don't quite have that critical mass. But, yeah. you know, they were, I don't even think you have to be playing Minotaurs to really make this thing work. But, um, you know, it, it does get you one step closer to a dedicated Minotaur deck, and I was enjoying seeing everybody on Twitter figure out how they could break this. Because this is a card you want to break. You're just like, how? Yeah. What can we do? And like, that's the kind of magic I like. Is, all right, let's see what you guys come up with. We're breaking yep. out the Didgeridoos. <laughs> the Didgeridoos are coming back that's around. Right. Didgeridoos with Morog. Yeah. Can yes. Make it happen. So for my number five, uh, my number seven was a rare land that had a really cool rare spell. While Wizards wasn't done with that, Wizards ain't satisfied with just a rare cycle, whatever. No, 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 no. We're going to go Mythic, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go to the most expensive of the Mythic Tubble-Faced lands, 
This card is bananas. I cannot, I can't, I can't. Like, it's one thing to say the other card, like, had that kind of built in. You, you're you're going to play the land tapped every time. No, no. When it comes to the mythic ones, they said, look, okay, let's talk about the spell. Because technically the front side is the spell. All right. The front side of this is turn timber symbiosis. Yeah. Oh, three green. Card. Yeah. Three green, four generic mana. So that's seven mana for a mythic sorcery where you look at the top seven cards of your library. You put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield. If that card has converted mana cost three or less, it enters up with three additional plus one plus one counters on it. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Now, if you don't like that or it's turn one, you just flip it over and there is turn timber serpentine, serpentine wood. This is a mythic land that as it enters the battlefield you may pay three life if you don't it enters the battlefield tapped and it taps for green so yes would i pay three life so i can play my land of War elves or whatever it is but would i be excited on this when i have a million mana because i'm the green deck so i can play the front side hell yeah it's yep. great it's just amazing on both sides there's just it's, it's great so on good sides. i can't stand how good this card is it just freaks me out how good these cards and are even even the fail case i mean if you whiff on all of the cards that really stinks but if the fail case is you hit your like one one it's still a four four like right. it still hits it still gets those counters and the top end is you hit emrakul right. right you just hit something ridiculous uh that that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten to hit right you hit something stupid and even if it's you know you got your tangled floor he drawn well it's a four mm -hmm. four right i mean <laughs> yeah worse things have happened it's yeah. fine but uh, yeah, this this card, just the idea of having an entire cycle of mythics where you can pay three life instead of two. They're a little worse yeah. than shocks, but really man, cool. The upside they do feel is, they feel mythic. Lord, and yes. It's tough to get a mythic feeling on a land, much less a cycle of lands. But these do have that feel. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did a great job. Let's move on here to number four. Aaron rejoins us. What is your number four? So it feels really good to get a preview card. It feels even better when your preview card is good or mm -hmm. people think that it's good. And I'll never forget how good it felt to finish recording our, our live show where we got to debut this card and see Twitter lit up with people thinking of ways to use this card and talking about the decks they want to put this in. Um, and, and there's just nothing better than that. Uh, my number four is Cleansing Wildfire. Mm -hmm. um, so Cleansing Wildfire is one colorless in a red. It's a sorcery. It says destroy target land. Its controller may search their library for a base land put it onto the battlefield tapped then shuffle their library and you draw a card mm. so two mana land destruction like that's insane <sighs> Um, you know, this could easily see play in modern. You know, Tron is still very much a force. Fulminator Mage can sometimes be too slow. Um, you know, you have Field of Ruin, but you still technically need two lands and that to do it. And so this is two mana land destruction. Um, in red, uh, the prowess decks are huge right now in modern, whether it be red blue or red black or mono red. Uh, burn is still very much a thing. Popper, there's been a lot of talk about this scene play in Popper with either land destruction decks or, you know, blitz decks or burn decks or what have you. Uh, Tron has been a thing in that format as well um mm. and just a lot of people speculating as to where this card could see play and um it just felt so good um just to see people talking about our card you know because you know quite frankly a lot of commons don't get talked about like this and it also has those magical words of draw a card that That's... alone can <sighs> catapult a card from being unplayable to playable and i'm so excited to see where our baby goes yeah once again the bottom case scenario is that it replaces itself Right, it plays itself, it probably gets rid of whatever their best land is, whatever their best right. non-basic land or it, be, or any yeah, land, I mean, it's, it, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, and the top case is that it gets rid of their Field of the Dead, or their flipped Search for Azkanta, or, you know, whatever other nonsense people are playing in older formats, you know, it gets rid of their Dark Depths. Right. Um, yeah, that, I mean, this card just seems so good. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of uh, Path to Exile. You know, mm. you can't, Swords to Plowshares is just too much. It's too good mm. on the power scale. It would be too good to just gain sure. some life and get rid of that forever. But you had to give them a land, right? Yeah. And this one feels like if it had been three mana, we'd have said, well, this is the fixed stone rain, right? Except they're giving right. you a draw card on the end of it. And we'd be like, well, it's a fixed stone rain, so now you get to draw yeah. a card, but they get their land back, so whatever. And I feel like Wizards was like, had this at three, and they went, well, let's just do it at two. Let's just, let's just make it two. It's fine. It'd be all right. I mean, it is nice. It'll drive the kids wild, and it certainly has. All right, so that was your number four. Ruben, mm -hmm. what's your number four? My number four, I think, is a card that Aaron's going to be proud of me for, because okay. this is a card that, man, I just feel like we were talking about how both sides of Tangled Florahedron are good, and they're good. Like, they're role players. But I feel like both halves of this card are 
are great. Like, on the one hand, you get a 2-1 with Menace and Lifelink for two mana. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you get a 2-1 with Menace and Lifelink for two mana and also a Zombify. Mm -hmm. And that's Null Priest of Oblivion. Null Priest of Oblivion is a colorless and a black for a 2-1 Vampire Cleric. It has Kicker of 3 colorless and a black. It has Menace and Lifelink. Goodness. And when Null Priest of Oblivion enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Six mana is not a lot to have to pay for that. Uh, it's a little bit of a tax for a Zombify, but when you attach it to a creature like this, that's really good. It's not a tax, it's an upgrade. It's not a bug, it's a feature. What are we I doing know, here? No, six mana is a, for six mana, I better get a back rub dinner and a ride home. You know what You're I'm getting Menace Lifelink in a 2-1. But, but it's, it's, I mean, she I like plays vintage. Art. She don't have an yeah, idea yeah. what six I mean, mana in really standard, is. In standard, <clears throat> this thing is going to be really, really good. Not only is it a cleric, but it's good early and it's I good late. I love the art. A yeah. Shout out to a Young Ji Choi. I think the art is beautiful, but... You know, mana in this economy. <laughs> you ever, you ever seen like billionaires try to talk about how much a gallon of milk costs? Right, that's exactly. where Aaron's at when it comes to getting stuff out of cars and the, what she's paying versus what she's getting. I mean, the how rate much is a gallon of, a, of milk? Like twelve dollars? I don't know. Look, Who has any idea? Ignore, ignore the kicker. How much does a zombify with? cost? Well, it better be zero. <laughs> Two or we're turning menace, this car around. 2-1 like, Menace Lifelink <laughs> for a Vampire Cleric. You're playing this in your Black-White Vampires deck. Yes. Like, I don't know how else to tell you that. Lord, yes. I mean, I could also put this in a Cleric deck. Like, if I'm playing my yeah. own. Yeah, my... Yeah. That's what I'm this saying. This card is sick. This card... Like, it's Zombify with no tax added. It's not too black and too generic <laughs> mana for the kicker. It's just right. straight Zombify. I can't... It's serviceable. It's, get out of here. <laughs> Go on with your twelve dollar gallon of milk. Just get out. I don't need you. Oh my get god. excited about new magic cards. I swear to God, this was my number ten, by the way, because I yeah. love this card. Card's it's, absurd. Card is fantastic. Uh, arguably, the, the card I'm most afraid of is my number four. Oh. This is a card that has a lot of potential. Maybe it's not that great. I like it when it, they're scary, but they end up not scary because when they're scary and they end up scary, God help us all. Um, but I do know that there's certainly an excitement that is built around Nissa of Shadowed Bows mm -hmm. that I cannot wait to see what happens with this card. It's a green and a black. Six. Oh, nice. A green and black and two generic mana for a mythic legendary planeswalker Nissa. It has four starting loyalty and it has landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a loyalty counter on it. Plus one colon untap target land you control. You may have it become a three, three elemental creature with haste and menace until end of turn. It's still a land. Minus five, you may put a creature card with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of lands you control onto the battlefield from your hand or graveyard with two plus one plus one counters on it. Wow. I'm a big fan of this card, obviously. I like that they took two planeswalkers and stapled popular mechanics onto them. You know, Jace mm -hmm. with Kicker and her with Landfall. I think that opens up some really nice design space. But, you know, we get to see kind of a dark side of Nyssa, and it's a really right. interesting take on Golgari. You know, I remember in the opening story when her and Nahiri were talking, and Nahiri was like, let's not act like you're innocent either. And she was like, oh... Right. And so, you know, it really, I, I'm interested to see where they go with the storyline in terms of, you know, how they delineate between like heroes and villains. And, you know, I imagine this is a story where like morality is going to get a little blurry. And yeah. um, I'm, in, I, I'm interested to see sort of this, this other side of Nyssa before. I don't want her to be as problematic as she was, but I think she needed a little, she needed a, to be bringing a little bit more to the table than just right. a Shia. And I think there's a lot of, of and, and also wonderful art by Jung Chi Cho again, mm. uh, Jung Chi Choi, um, beautiful art. And um, this is, this is a fun card. Yeah, yeah, this is a card that from the from the graveyard just gets me every time. I mean, you're cycling big stuff from Ikoria, and then this girl shows up, and here comes the boom booms. Like, I would not have blinked if this card had cost five mana. Yeah. I would have been like, oh, that's a pretty good Planeswalker for five mana. Exactly. The fact that it cost four Oof. means that this is probably the strongest of the three Planeswalkers in the set, in my opinion. It probably. is. It's, it's going to come out on turn three a lot. It's going to do a lot of crazy things. And it's just, it's it's a problem at every phase of the game. All of its abilities are good. I love this card. Yeah, yeah this card is sweet. And even given the land menace, which is like that cool yeah. kind of black part of it, but also yeah. great because it's going to help you get in damage. Like, oh, it's so sweet. This card it, is it great. It doesn't feel, at least right now, it doesn't feel as oppressive as Nissa shakes the world because with that oh, one, yeah. it's like these are creatures and they have vigilance and they don't go away. And it's they just don't like, go away. There the is this card. feeling of hopelessness 
hopelessness. And mm-hmm. it, it does seem like there are some things about this card that, that can be fixed or can be dealt with. Right. Right. It, it doesn't double your mana, as it turns out. Yeah. Which, the other kind, thing is that you can, problem. on later in the game, you can play Nyssa, play a land, and immediately bring back something as like a, a makeshift um, a makeshift zombify with two plus one plus one counters. Love it. Yeah, it just makes them bigger. It's great. Twelve dollars for gallons of milk. It's whatever. All right, who want to hear to number three? I got it now. I got a line. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it. I'm gonna yank on that one. All right, Aaron, what's your number three? Uh, my number three is another card that people are speculating could see playing in multiple formats, particularly older formats. Um, you know, it's cheap. It's powerful. It has the ability to become more powerful over time. Uh, my number three is Blood Chief's Thirst. Um, so Blood Chief's Thirst is one black for a sorcery. Um, it says destroy target creature. Or planeswalker with converted mana cost two or less. Looking at you, red and six, like just dead for one mm. black mana. Um, you can also kick it for two and a black if the spell was kicked. Instead, destroy target creature or planeswalker. So, you know, great in the early game as like the sort of fatal push, you know, it e- gets rid of sort of easy to kill low mana cost creatures and planeswalkers. And then in the late game, four mana is not a lot. It's yeah. very easy to get to four mana, especially if you are playing a grindy kind of black green style deck, or even if you're just playing something like Grixis Delver or Sultai Delver, just something like that um you know you can easily get to four mana and then at that point you can kill anything and so um there's a lot of potential with this card i'm anxious to see if it lives up to it i I feel like if this had been an instant it would have been like a multi-format ridiculous Mm all-star until the end of time because the efficiency is so good and even still sorcery it's still great like it's still going to be great it's still going to be never to return ruinous path you know it's still going to be that level of good Mm -hmm. um it just isn't going to be end of turn snapcaster fatal push your creature because it's a sorcery but this card is still extremely powerful and it's going to keep those tibalts in check as well (laughs) yeah it is i mean this is also a card that because it exists it makes wizards more yeah, available to make two mana planeswalkers. That makes yeah. sense. So it makes that, that sort of design space open up because you have answers you've already built in and you're going to make more of them in the future. But because this exists, it's just one more piece of the puzzle of like, yeah, we'll make a powerful two mana planeswalker because you have this one mana answer right here. Right. So uh, cool, cool. Ruben, what's number three? My number three is a card. Whenever we do these top tens of sets that are coming out, um, I have a habit of putting a card near the top or at the top of my list that I feel like is going to be the barometer for red removal. Um, I had Lava Coil on my list. I had a Braid on my list when they came out. And I do think Thundering Rebuke is the the card. It is Uh the barometer that you're going to have to measure yourself against to be playable in standard. Thundering Rebuke is a colorless and red for a sorcery. Thundering Rebuke deals four damage to target creature or planeswalker. Phew. Woof. That is huge. It's that huge. clears out that clears out a Jace most of the time. Yeah. That clears out a Nissa a lot of the time. Yeah. That clears out almost every two and three drop. And a lot of the four drops. Uh, you know, there, there's the four four flying dragon that fireballs you when it dies. Right. There's, you know, uh big, big stuff that's worrisome from one to two to three on up. And this is able to take care of them. This is going to be a huge part of the red and blue spells decks. Mm-hmm. The anything that is a control deck that can play this, I think they're going to. Yeah, there's um there's sort of a, a magical kind of design constant when it comes to red removal spells and their effect on the standard environment no matter what it is whether it's incinerate whether it's lightning bolt whether it's lava coil whether it's uh you know i mean down right down the shock right like whatever the best most efficient thing you can do in terms of red damage and then you say all right you want to make your best creatures or the creatures that you care about have to meet that standard or exceed it like that's basically been true from the beginning right like from the back in the days when we played wildfire emissary because it didn't die a lightning bolt it was one of the only four drops that didn't like that was a right. thing that we did because they defined the formats yeah. for you so they can make these planeswalkers with really high loyalty counts as long as this kind of card removes a bunch of that loyalty which it is certainly doing and i appreciate it so uh but speaking of things you could deal four damage to here comes my number three it's hey. 
It's big, scary. What what kind of freaky looking dragon is this Leyline Tyrant guy anyway? Mm. This weird dude. <laughs> it is beautiful and it is valid. That's it right. is. So it looks wrong. like it's made out of a dinosaur skeleton. You know what this actually reminds me of is when you're on the freeway and you, they have like those yeah those little um, dividers thing right to yeah. keep you on to make sure you don't fall off. That's yeah. what it kind of right. looks like. Where it's like this nice. He wants to keep you on the road. Just so for those who don't know, Leyline Tyrant is too red, too generic mana for a four four mythic dragon with flying. You don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end. Uh, what a red now. When Leyline Tyrant dies, you may pay any amount of red mana. When you do, it deals that much damage to any target. Get your braid of fires. What is happening? Those things are already unbelievably expensive. By I'm yeah, sure they are. They, are. they yeah. desperately need to reprint. Uh, this is my number five. Nice. Uh, I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, an Omnath in red that, yeah. you know, when you kill it, you have the potential to take something down. On its own, it's fine. Like, most people would pay four for four. four, four. Yeah. Like, that's cool. Yeah. But, you Great, know, if you got unread, if you got unused red mana just chilling, well, now you can... You know, save it for a rainy day and then top deck a draw spell and blow their face off. I mean, yeah. just think of it this way, right? So don't think of it even necessarily as you're you're building up for a big end for Leyline Tyrant. Just say, okay, next turn, tap all my mana. I'll play a land, so that's five. Then turn yeah. after that, I'll tap them all again. Then I'll play some some huge gigantic dragon with it. Like that's a way this right. helps you land like ramp your mana and be scary if it dies. Like it mm-hmm. it slices, it dices, it scares the hell out of your opponent constantly. I, I, there's no downside to this card. It's the insane. other thing, the other thing about this card is you don't need to play spells after it. Like right. this is the definition of a red finisher. Yeah. There's you, you play this and you untap. You don't need to do anything else for the rest of the game. That's yeah. right. You just play this and attack for four and attack for four. It doesn't matter if they're at sixty. Just keep adding red to your mana pool. And then someday you'll, you know, thundering uh, blow up your own dragon right. or sacrifice it to, to, your, to, to a village rights or something right. and deal them 30. This card is unbelievable. And oh, by the way, it's a 4-4 four, four flyer for four. Yeah. Card's yeah. just absurd. Card is value on top of value on top of value. Let's move on here to number two. Aaron, what's number two? This is another card that kind of scares me a little bit. Um, colorless decks and artifact decks have seen play uh, in older formats for a while now. You know, in Legacy, your 12 post decks, um, Eldrazi is still very much a thing as being one of the prison decks of the format. Um, and in Vintage, you have Workshops, which, you know, has been kept down a little bit um, thanks to cards like Collector, Oof, and Force of Vigor, but is still very much a, a pillar of the format. Um, and so when I see colorless, you know, I, I think that, you know, this, this card could do some work. Uh, my number two is for Forsaken Monument. Um, so Forsaken Monument is five colorless. It's a legendary artifact. It says colorless creatures you control get plus two, plus two. Whenever you tap a permanent for colorless, add an additional colorless. So that's Mishra's Workshop. That's um, Soul Ring. <laughs> Soul Ring. That's Basalt Monolith. That's right. uh, Mana Vault. You know, Mana... Mana Crypt, you know, whenever you cast a colorless spell, you gain two life. So five mana is not hard to do um, in older formats, especially. Um, you know, this is everything any sort of colorless deck could want. It makes your creatures bigger. It gives you life as a cushion, because if you're playing colorless, you're probably playing Ancient Tomb, and so you're probably hurting yourself. Um, and this helps you, you know, kind of recoup that life. Um, it also gives you extra mana, so you can make bigger walking ballistas and things like that. Um, and so when I saw this card and I saw five mana, I was like, that's not hard. <laughs> No. It makes your Eldrazi spawns two threes. It makes your Eldrazi scions three threes. It makes your, it makes your, you know, already giant Eldrazi even bigger. It Mm -hmm. lets your Forsaken Waste, it lets your Wastes tap for two. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, uh, and this is really one of the only, there's very, very little mention of the Eldrazi in this set, if at all. And this is one of the few cards that like just barely touches on it. And yeah. You know, well, Go ahead. What what is an adventure world without buried ruins mm-hmm. to uncover? And yeah. this is a great example of that. Yeah. yeah. And it's also interesting to me because uh funnily enough, Syndicar Rising has twenty mythics in it. And most sets have had 16. Ikoria had 16. Uh, Theros Beyond Death had 18. Uh, and so to have 20 gives you the room to have sort of extra really cool artifacts and colorless cards. And I'll get to another one here in just a minute. But Ruben, first, what's number two? My number two is a card that I think is going to be one of, if not the premier control finishers in the set. It's, uh, no, I'm kidding. It's, uh, it's Leviathan crab. It's a Leviathan crab. <laughs> 
it's it's one of my favorite things that they've ever made from Magic the Gathering. I had to put it at number two because it's a Leviathan, mm -hmm. but it's also a crab. My number two is Cherix or Carex, the Raging Isle. Carex oh. is two colorless blue blue for a legendary creature Leviathan Crab. And I'm not going to give a stat line just yet because it's the funniest part. Oh Spells your opponent's cast that target Carex, the Raging Isle, cost two colorless blue more to cast or two generic more to cast mm -hmm. it also has an activated ability three colorless carex gets plus x minus x until end of turn where x is the number of islands you control <laughs> it is an o 17 <laughs> that so boy silly. that boy is thick with My 17 seven. c's yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, just a fun card. It's going for a little over a dollar right now. I mean, this was this was another card that got the Brewers brewing in terms of Commander. Um, yeah. You can pair this with uh, Tetsuo Tetsuko Umazawa, the one that yep. makes things unblockable. Um, you know, there's all sorts of dumb things you can do with this, and it's just it's just a fun, you know, kind of wholesome card. Probably isn't going to see any standard play, but the Commander players are eating this up. Yeah, yeah, this is where you I, get a special promo version if you buy the bundle. Uh, this car, like, it, it just, you know, like, this is like the development meeting, right? Like, wh how big can we make it? Well, it's how, an 012. That's silly. Keep going, right? Right. But they're finally well, like, that's enough. 017, yeah. fine. 018 is ridiculous. Goes, it goes great with things like uh, training grounds, for example. Mm -hmm. um, any sort of blue. It's a, it's a mana sink. So any mm -hmm. sort of blue... Uh, repeatable effect to get more lands or whatever you need is amazing. You can combo this with Twisted Image, for example. <laughs> if you like activate it and oh, then God, flip it around, um, you can go nuts. It, this thing is just great. Oh Goodness my God. gracious. Yeah, this card is super duper sweet. And, you know, for your merfolk thaumaturgist to do the Twisted Image thing on a stick. Sure. Could do that too. That's that's Perfect. always fun. Yeah, the silly legendary crabs are things that I enjoy and I want. This is the first off. legendary crab. Yeah, this is the very, very first, isn't it? Uh, but silly crabs doing silly things, I'll take it. So, as we mentioned about Forsaken Monument, we got 20 Mythics in the set. We can do really cool, interesting artifact cards. The instant I saw this card, I was like, oh my god. This is going to be just like Doubling Season. This is going to be one of those cards that is lauded. It's going to be, the reprints are going to be seen as a super huge deal. Oh. This card's going to be played in so many freaking decks. Lithoform Engine goes into everything, literally yep. everything, to make copies yeah. of everything. <laughs> it is four generic mana for a mythic legendary artifact. Two generic mana tap colon copy target activated or triggered ability you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. Three generic mana tap colon copy target instant or sorcery you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. And four generic mana tap colon copy target permanent spell you control. The copy becomes a token. Card's That's dumb. Like so, that card says the word copy too many times. It's just <laughs> Wizards is like we don't we understand that copying sucks. Copying sucks so hard. We're going to give you two different ways to do it, and oh, you can also copy your own stuff that's on the battlefield. I mean, there's reasons. no reason not to run this card at Commander, right? I mean, like every card, every color yeah, can run it. Every one it covers every sort of thing you could possibly do. Yeah. You know, whether you're a spell heavy deck or you're a permanent heavy deck. Mm -hmm. You know, you need those mana sinks, and you know, at, you just start kind of make copying your own stuff, like. This card is really, really good. And you can copy, copy triggered target. abilities and stuff too, like the Panharmonicons of the world. Like they go nuts. Oh, yeah. Well, you can make another Panharmonicon because you can copy target permanent spell exactly. that you control. So why not? Mm. Go you to could, town. You could tap four to copy it, <clears throat> do something to untap it, and then copy the, the trigger, the, the activated ability. <laughs> There's so I, much cool stuff you can do with this stupid card. I can't stand it. Wow. It's already like 20 something plus dollars, 30 yeah. plus for the extended, you know, art or whatever. Like this card oh is goodness. dumb. I love yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. that was my number two. We barrel around to our number one choice. Aaron, what's your number one? My number one might not look like much and it might not see a lot of play. But when you think of the implications and what this means for the color pie, this card is huge. My number one is Feed the Swarm. Um, so Feed the Swarm is one colorless and a black. It's a sorcery. Destroy target creature 
or enchantment Oof. an opponent controls, Oof. you lose life equal to that permanence converted mana cost. This is the first time that mm. Mono Black has been given an ability or a card that says destroy target enchantment. They've been flirting with letting you sacrifice them. Right. Uh, we were right. given Mire and Misery, which says each opponent sacrifices a creature or enchantment. Uh, we also got Farika's Libation, which says target opponent sacrifices an enchantment. But if the opponent's playing multiple enchantments, they can choose. And right. so they can choose their crappy one and then you really don't have anything or if you give them the choice you know they may not choose what you want them to this is you get to target this is black having targeted enchantment removal it's never been done you know i'm playing modern in- i'm playing modern ad nauseum right now and there's yeah. if you play rakdos luris you slam a leyland of sanctity and you laugh at them because they have literally nothing for it this could change that you know not only is it creature removal it's also enchantment removal and so this is terrifying and maro put out an article today talking about uh giving stories behind some of the cards and he even said like this is a huge we're gonna see what happens i don't think it's gonna be like game breaking or anything but you know just to see how far black has come you know even up until a few years ago, you know, Black had no way to really deal with Planeswalkers. Now we don't really right. blink when Black can kill Planeswalkers. But destroy enchantment in Black, in mono Black, normally you got to splash for this. you gotta, you got to go Golgari or something. Or you got to go uh, maybe, you know, Orzov or something. This is yeah. mono Black. Like, this is huge. This is definitely huge. The fact that I've had conversations with Wizards employees over the years and been like, yeah, we'll put enchantment removal in Black. And they just, like, laugh it off. It wasn't even, <laughs> we might think about it. It's a thing. Maybe one day. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> Black and enchant removal. You insane. Right. Like this is really important. I like that you brought it up yeah. because this is a huge sort of watershed moment for what the colors can do. Right. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but it's like it's mortify. It targets a creature or an enchantment for yeah. two mana. I mean, yeah. it is sorcery speed, but like and that's still life, huge. Yeah. And you lose life, but Vendetta saw play. Yeah. I mean, well, you know. So you, I'll take it. Yeah, this card is definitely sweet and uh, one that would fly under the radar if not. You know, thanks to your pick. <laughs> Ruben, what's number one? My number one was never going to fly under anybody's radar. Mm. It's it's a card that I don't think anyone's surprised is at the top of my list. I think that if you were to look at the spoiler and be like, what is the Ruben Bressler card going to be? Everyone would have picked this one. I talked about it on the show, the most recent live show, where, you know, we have our iconic colorless and a color creatures. Mm -hmm. We have Stoneforge Mystic. We have Snapcaster Mage. We have Dark Confidant. And we have Tarmogoyf. We don't really, I mean, we have Young Pyromancer, but that doesn't really fill the red slot, in my opinion. We've had a couple here and there. I actually, honest to goodness, think Magmatic Channeler is going to be that good. Magmatic Channeler is a colorless and a red for a human wizard. It's a 1-3. As long as there are four or more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, Magmatic Channeler gets plus 3 plus 1, meaning it becomes a 4-4. Four, four. Tap, discard a card, colon, exile the top two cards of your library, then choose one of them. You may play that card this turn. This card is unbelievable. For what it does in red is, I mean, it's efficient... Uh, it dodges a lot of removal. It doesn't get around, you know, lightning bolt or whatever. But I don't sure. think you. I don't think I want a world where this is a one four to start with. No, let yeah. alone being a, a four four later. Yeah, the only thing that really kind of gets in its way when it comes to older formats is Dreadhorde Arcanist is is a thing yeah. right now, and that and you know it's also a two mana one three with a very powerful effect. But mm-hmm. you know, I, different flavors. You know, there may come a time where this is something that people want instead. But you know, it does have you know all of the pedigrees. It does have the pedigree of a good card where it is good. You don't have to try to make it good. You can just play magic, and before you know it, you're going to meet that first requirement. It's card advantage in red, which I really like, and um, it's 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 something we haven't seen before. It's discarding and exiling, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the discard kind of feeds itself. um, And it's only going for like two or three dollars right now. So this seems like something I would get in. It's the discard that makes it like sort of work, essentially, because Mm -hmm. there's no mana cost that you have to play to activate the second ability. So it's sort of like the ultimate filtering, right? You can sort of ultimately, or not only are you filling this ability for the, the first ability is you discard, but then you look at the top two and you say, oh, there's an instant owner sorcery. I want those because if I just get one more, the Chandler's into a 4-4, four, four, you know, and, and Bob's your uncle or whatever. So like, high five. <laughs> and, and Robert's your father's brother. Um, <laughs> but love, love me some Magmatic Chandler. Robert's your, Robert's your father's brother. Bob's your uncle. That's I've right. I've never heard of that. Yeah, yeah. I watched oh this comedian God. who does a really funny cooking show and he ran that one out and I've just I have ran oh that God. one ever since. 
It is Australian, so it's great. I love yeah. it. Okay. It's fantastic. All right. So for my number one, um, <clears throat> I know it's a little greedy. A little greedy. I probably am maybe technically kind of outside of the rules when you talk about more than one card. Yeah, well. But if we're going to talk about watershed moments, we're talking about moments where like my jaw like just dropped. When I found out about this card, I was like, are you serious? Like I had to see it to believe it. And the fact that they made six of the ten in the cycle, the fact that they have already promised that the other four are coming in call time, that they are so cool, so powerful, so playable. Some of the most played cards that will come out of Zendikar Rise, and I am convinced, is yeah. the Pathway Cycle. The Pathway Cycle is freaking fantastic there's nothing wrong with these cards it's just beautiful it's it's like it's almost poetic it's so nice let's like take for example uh bright climb pathway this is the white one and this is a rare land that taps for white mana or you flip it over and there's grim climb pathway and it's a rare land that taps for a black mana you only get the one go. decision the one time it's just it's such fantastic gameplay it's so great that it doesn't give everything to the multicolored decks but it gives them just enough like it's cool fixing but it's not perfect you can't go fetch for it so there's that but like it's right. so good in your open hand it's so good for digital like it's so sweet i freaking love it if there's anything that made me love double face cards immediately it was this cycle yeah Interesting. this is a really clever way to do duels in the lands centric set yeah. i mean you had a high bar when you're Zendikar, you're coming back to Zendikar and there's these expectations mm -hmm. of coming back to Zendikar. We want it to be the adventure world. We want it to be the lands place. But we also want good two-color lands. Well, what do we do that we haven't done before? This lived up to all those expectations. Yeah. This whole cycle is absolutely And fantastic. they never come into play tapped? No. Correct. So you just always get to choose. Wow. Just get to choose you, whatever you want. You just choose which one you want. Mm. This is, I mean, <clears throat> again, it's just the fact that you can run, you know, a green-white deck and run the green land that flips to white and the white land that flips to green. You need to run all of those. It's just, it's just fantastic. I can't yeah. get over how good these freaking cards are and how close, just so close we keep getting to that. It's not better than a basic land, but my <laughs> God, it is on the right. absolute edge. They just keep creeping closer. Yeah. Now, we are only going to get 10 of these, uh, which means that we are getting the 10 color combos. Yes. Uh, we aren't getting 20 of these, which means that there isn't going to be a green one that has white on the back and a white one that has green on the back. We're only going to get the 10. Yeah, so fair enough. So we only get but, the, kind of the one. But but again, that also gives them another 10 that they true. could make. That they could do in the future. One day in the future, absolutely. And then you would have your cake and eat it too, which sounds awesome. And uh, yeah, so those Pathway Lands are amazing. And that was our top 10 Zendikar Rising cards. You will see them on screen right now if you review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10. And we want to hear from you what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. And be sure to tune into the Early Access event where we, where we will be playing all sorts of crazy new cards and decks. Woo woo. Yeah, and thank and you. Watch the watch the VODs, yeah. Yeah, the boss we post right here on this YouTube channel. Thank you, Ruben. And now, your moment of zen. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Christ. Moving on here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-hosts, Aaron Camel and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching or listening. I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, treat, favor, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast .com, or find us on iTunes and Spotify. Or join us here next week. Same same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.